Hello and good morning and welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and a very, very, very large portion of Quindy with a tiny chance of John or Justin. Actually, it'd be a shrinkingly small chance of John or Justin, but we carry on anyway. How are you all? Meow. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's kitty cat day. Kitty cat day. Happy kitten Friday. <laughs> There we go. Happy kitten indeed. Although, um, I'm debating on my, uh, my lining there because it's so dark next to everything else. So either I have to darken the shadows in the armor or I've got to, uh, lighten the lining or both or both, maybe both. Anyway, yay. Alrighty. Any, any fun things going on this Friday for y'all? Any cool plans? I'm going to whip out my uh, colors for the NMM, which if you recall, we were doing the, uh, the Kickstarter, um, two of the colors from the Kickstarter triad. We were doing Moon Moon Gray, or uh, sorry, Moonstone Blue, not Moon Moon Blue, or Gray, and Carbon Gray. So 9317-9318. Both excellent colors, just in general. Um, Moonstone's a great highlight for blues. Can also be a uh, just a great highlight for like if you're looking to go a little weird with gray greens. Ah, sorry, I have something in my teeth. Breakfast, grr. Doing laundry, fun. Oh, who's oh <laughs> puppy? Puppy was the featured pet. They're smart doing a featured pet. Then everybody will watch just to see the featured pet. Donut day, huh? Jedi Jared, 37 months in sanity. How could you put up with us for that long? <laughs> oh, no, I've got ear rub off. I took Kitty to the con, and you could totally tell because ear rub off. Whereas this ear is pretty protected as its interior. It's got the shield kind of, but this ear has definitely got a little bit of rub off. Okay, cool. As long as I'm still entertaining. Oh, birthday dinner. Cool. Very nice, Quindy. When <laughs> Kitty's first con. Yeah, I did a class on NMMs, so I brought Kitty because uh, he was in the early stages of the NMMs. Alrighty, so let's mix up some colors. First of all, I want our base coat, which is 5 to 1, moonstone with a drop of carbon gray. Yeah, my NMM class needs some help. Too ambitious. This is always the, ah, as I drop my paint, because it's what we do. But, uh, yeah, my first con was definitely too ambitious, uh, or my first NMM class. This is when you start a new class, you inevitably do this as an instructor, is what I found. You, uh, you always are way too ambitious. You're always like, I can cover all this material. And then... Life shows you that, no, actually, no, you can't. National Donut Day. I, uh, I don't really do donuts, though I had, um, I did glutenate a little bit last weekend and had a little bit of David's uh, apple fritter because apple fritter. There are certain baked goods that I get a slight minus to my save on. Donuts are not one of them. I pretty much trained myself not to want sweet gluten-y things by sniffing the donuts at Reaper. Like, seriously, I did. So donuts I have complete immunity to. Even the kinds that used to be my favorite kinds, I'm just like, bleh, not worth it. But uh, apple fritters. <laughs> seriously. Apple fritters I get a minus two, I would say. Cherry fritters, huh? My my biggest uh, my biggest evil thing is scones. Um, it's like first of all, Kodiak. The first thing you should do is uh, is work on understanding lighting first, like doing regular highlights and shadows on surfaces, because NMM probably won't click for you until you understand how to highlight well. 
So some people look at a model, they have no idea where to put the highlights and shadows uh, heading in. So learning that is necessary because in order to do NMM, you have to be able to imagine light falling on the model from above and kind of extrapolate from there where things go. So what I always say, if people, people tend to want to get into NM, NMM very early in their painting because it looks cool, which is cool. You mess around with it. Um, but keep in mind that, that that is the first thing you need to think about is where is light hitting on the model and where is the, uh, you know, where does it bounce? Yeah, one of my coming up fundamentals in mini painting videos will probably be on highlight placement. All right, let's put a couple of drops of water in this and then let's mix up some highlights. I was essentially going up with two brushes of my base coat plus two, two uh, more drops of, the, of Moonstone. So first we'll mix this up. This will give us a nice medium gray. It is the color that uh, was used to base coat the armor. It's actually a little lighter than I would normally start with NMM as I, I like to start a little bit more on the dark side, but because I wanted this armor to be very light and kind of silvery blue, I'm not going nearly as dark as I normally would. Hey, Lady Nim, how's it going? Yeah, scones are my thing. I love a good scone, especially a good citrus scone, lemon or orange. So those will, I have a minus four to saves versus scones. So it's possible for me to make my save. It's not likely. <laughs> it depends. We're talking about baked goods and NMM, a lady num. And it's Friday. It's Friday. I'm looking forward to working with my oil paints over the weekend because I did some tests to see um, I was getting uh, shininess issues because some oil paints are more fatty than others. They have more oil, higher oil content, so they tend to dry shinier. And I wanted, didn't want that. So I was like, how much solvent do I need to put into my oil paints to make them matte out? Because I knew there was a point where it would happen. So I did careful experiments and had to let them dry for a day or two uh, to see how much solvent I had to put in those fatty oil paints to make them dry matte. Because some of the oil paints, I can make them dry matte, no problem. But other oil paints are very, very oily. So this is me in my happy mad scientist mode. I love going mad scientist on things. Lemony, yes. Lemony baked goods. Me too, Quindy. Like lemon Madeira cake, except in my case, lemon Madeira cupcakes with like um, lemon sugary, melted lemon sugar like glaze. Like, yeah, yeah. Yum, 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 yum. We have a lemon tree, so I can be as lemony as I want to. Although I should make some lemon bars. We have fresh lemons. We've got a crop coming up right now. So I'm going to soon have more lemons that I can really deal with, which is awesome. It's an awesome place to be. Free lemons given to me by the ground. It's like, it's broken, I swear. Lemon trees are broken. All right, so now we've got a highlight. So let's build another highlight because, you know. Now, notice that I'm doing the same, kind of the same thing, except now, because I want it to be less dark and more blue, I'm going to use one brush full, just one instead of two, with two drops of moonstone, or moon moon, as I like to call it. And then, because I really want to punch it up, I'm going to go up to pure white and add one drop of pure white. Because otherwise, the, the moonstone is getting pretty close to my base grape since I'm lightening it. And if I really want a, a highlight, I need to add that pure white. Yeah, I love, I love our lemon tree so much. Like, that was one of the things we, I was, I was actively looking for in a house. Because so many houses have citrus trees out here. And all sorts of fruit trees. We actually, we have, um, our baby avocado tree, I don't think is going to grow avocados this year. It's still growing, but it shot up like a foot and a half. So it is growing fast. So hopefully maybe next year we'll have some avocados. But we have a baby avocado tree. And then in our front yard, such as it is, it's a very small front yard, but we have a, a baby orange tree. That one's not going to fruit this year either because it didn't have flowers earlier. 
but baby orange tree, baby avocado tree, and we have a baby fig tra- plant. I guess they are trees. I'm not a fig fan, but I've, I've, since they're going to have fresh ones, I'm going to maybe try to make a fig almond tart this year. See, I like to squeeze my lemon onto the salmon instead, Shadow Raven, because I find that if I put the lemon on the top, like the lemon, the fish doesn't get the kind of crusty feel like that I like. It keeps it softer. So, yeah, you know, however you wish to use lemon on your fish. But yeah, we're talking about food. Uh, big, yeah, fig almond tart. Yeah, that was the, because I love almond. So I figure, oh, the, I don't have to give the figs to the squirrels, Pendrake. The, the squirrels will freaking take the fig. If you don't pick the fig, the instant it's ripe, the squirrels will yoink those figs right out of there. Like, that is, I swear that our wildlife, like, has a free food plan, like, pretty much with all these, like, fig trees. Because there's a lot of fig trees in this neighborhood. And, uh, I, I, yeah, it's, it's pretty much, it's crazy. Like, it's a battle against the squirrels, pretty much. They don't care about the lemons and limes, so I'm safe there. But the avocado tree is going to be a point of contention, I'll tell you that. But yeah, fig almond tart is the probably the most, it was the tastiest fig recipe I could find, Quindy, because I'm not a huge fig fan. So usually I don't mind that the squirrels take them because then we don't have, you know, figs rotting on the tree. It's a very small tree. I keep it trimmed back because I'm not a huge fig fan and I don't want it to get out of hand because the last thing you want is like figs dropping all over the place and me having to clean them up instead of like doing cooler things like painting and making videos for y'all. So I'm going to make some pure white also. So here we go. We're going to have a pentad here. Hey, five colors. Anybody surprised? No. <laughs> right. Most people don't, right? Except out here, there are fig trees everywhere. Like, there are tons of figs. I had never encountered a wild fig <laughs> prior to California. <laughs> but now I have. Um, they're weird things. They're weird, weird, weird fruit. David's dad likes them. So when he's here for the wedding, like, maybe I'll offload figs onto him. I just, maybe I'll get, like, maybe I'll get a taste for them if I eat really fresh homegrown ones. Yeah, yeah. If the animals will, they, they find the edibles. They can smell them. All right, now let's grab some gray liner for our shadows. Oh, wait, no, we've got carbon gray. What am I saying? I'm so silly. I think I even mentioned last time that I normally would use gray liner, but I was using carbon gray this time to make myself use the triad. The highlight for the triad is misty gray, by the way. And if you didn't want this strong blue color to the armor, you would use the misty gray, so you would use that triad. And it comes out very well. I uh, did, I showed a picture of it, and I did a PDF on this triad a long time ago on the Patreon. Uh, it was this triad and, and a couple. I did I did uh, kind of a review of those Kickstarter colors. And there's a picture of a fire giant sword that I painted with the carbon gray, moonstone blue, and, and foggy gray. I'm going to have to put a lot of water into this carbon gray to make it translucent. So I'm going to put four one to one pretty much. Hey, Jofer. I think the best option for figs is like tarts and stuff. Tarts or jams. Like I have had a fig orange spread that I really enjoyed as far as jams. So I could see making jam with it once our orange tree gets up there and uh, starts giving us oranges. Then I could make fig orange jam that was fresh like fresh homegrown ingredients and everything organic in the truest sense of the word that could be fun because i do i do really think that fig and orange do go well together and then make some almond cookies to spread it on oh okay now we're talking so i could eat a i could make a fig orange almond fig newton <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what these fruits are growing on our neighbor's tree, and I'm trying to decide if they're apples. They might be. They're turning, they started out green, and now they're turning pinkish reddish. But they're definitely intruding on our yard. Like, there's one branch that's, like, way over into our yard. So, like, if the neighbor's tree is going to give us apples, I'm picking those. <laughs> it's their job to trim that branch. <laughs> 
Yeah, I got organic mint too. Ah, uh, War Shadow. Minus 50 DKP. Alrighty, so now our full triad, if we if we ever get there. <laughs> there we go. So there's pure white on one end and near black on the other. And this is why steel NMM is so hard. Because you have to somehow bridge that gap. And, and if you're going to do it right or do it well, you need to at least blend it a bit. You don't have to have perfect blending to make your NMM look, look right. Um, but, you know, it can help. It can help. And if you're trying to do a very shiny surface, then you do kind of need to really, really blend. If you're doing a burnished NMM, you can get away with a lot, especially at 28 mil. This is a very, like, I wanted to make a pale silvery blue. I find that I, you use the same colors for steel and silver. Uh, but this one, um, this one, because uh, he has tons of armor, I really did want to go for a very light, very pale and almost bluish um, NMM. Because the orange fur, it also plays off the orange fur to have the blue and the orange. So we are doing that. We are doing that. But this would not be like, like you, you could use these colors for silver jewelry on a model, but it would be kind of wasted unless they were, it was a lot of jewelry on a big model, like a bust, because you're just not going to see the difference really between just using my normal cloudy gray formula with gray liner and white and using this, like you're going to probably on a, on a small area, remember with muted colors, dull colors, like grayed out colors like this. On a small area, if there is a color in there, you're going to completely lose it. Like, nobody will see it. Uh, it's only when you can cover an area with a lot of the color that you're going to retain a little bit of that blue feel. So remember that using this recipe on anything small is probably, like small jewelry bits or anything, still sword hilts, things like that, is probably a waste. Oh, nice. Asparagus. Yeah, that's really nice, Kodiak. Wow, maybe I should maybe I should plant some asparagus. We do eat it. We alternate usually with asparagus and salad during the summer. Um, I don't remember what the blossoms look like, Shadow Raven, sadly. Now I'm just looking at the fruits. They are getting kind of big. I maybe they're plums or something. I have no idea, but I do know that I have a ladder and that that branch is growing about oh, nine feet in the air, which means I can acquire those fruits. I would complain, but why? <laughs> Free fruit. <laughs> and the neighbor can't even really yell at us about it because it's in our yard. The tree is intruding. Technically, it's above our yard, but it's over the fence, darn it, by at least five feet. Well, it depends on the, actually, Joe Ferk, it depends uh, probably on the state, right? As whether that is yours or, or your neighbor's. But I guess if it didn't intrude, probably they are my fruit. So, yeah. Free fruit. I'm not going to complain. Like, I don't eat a lot of fruit, and I'm pretty selective what I do eat. I do love cantaloupe, but we're not going to get that off of a tree. Cantaloupe is probably my favorite favorite fruit like bananas used to be it apples are really up there though too so yeah it's gonna be but i also love grapefruit i just have to be careful because it's so acidic i made a killer grapefruit vinaigrette the other day i was not expecting it to amount to much but it actually turned out really well all right so i think i need to shade more on this nmm although it is looking pretty good from this angle so maybe We'll keep going along this and kind of see how it turns out in the end. Because I haven't added final highlights. I haven't added final shadows. Let's do this leg. Let's mock out, mock in this leg for those who missed the first episode. No melons grow on vines. Yeah, and vines are just dangerous here because the animals can get to them. Oh, nice. Roasted chicken with figs and balsamic. That sounds tasty, Trojan. David likes likes plums, but I'm not a huge plum fan, so I would be happier if they were apples. Very sweet, despite the vinegar. Yeah, because figs are, well, and and to be to be fair, balsamic is also sweet, right? So I thinned this way down. I'm going to use this carbon gray to line these um, these little plates on on his hip. 
And this is the kind of um, the kind of little scale mail that is really good for lining practice. We're not we have no HOA. This is one of the most like this is one of the oldest neighborhood associations in uh, in Mountain View. It's probably the oldest. So there is no such thing as an HOA here. It's a community org. It's not a doesn't have the structure of an HOA. I don't think anybody here wants one. Downside to that is there are some houses that are really falling apart. Upside is no HOA. <laughs> I'll look it up. I'll, I will look it up. I'll tell you what. Although there are a lot of houses on the street in this neighborhood, because there are a lot of lime trees and orange trees growing like right near the street, the, this, the houses have signs of, please do not pick the fruit unless you ask first. So they're okay with you picking a lime or something, but they want you to ask before you intrude on their tree, which is fair. I'm so tempted, it is so tempting though, you just walk by these trees full of fat little tangerines or oranges or limes and you're just like, your hands are itching and you wish you brought, wish, wish you brought a clipper. Maybe if you're me. So these are some of the easiest uh, types of scales to practice lining on, because they're really a straight line and then you're just cross hatching. So this model in general is a good one. I think to practice lining on because you've got all these big plates and then you've got these the small plates or the crosshatch type plates. Remember that you need to practice lining to get good at it. And if you get good at lining, you will find that you have miraculously also become good at hitting fine details. So this is why I tell you, go and line. Go forth and line. Even if you decide that you don't like the effect and that you'd rather do some sort of other shading that isn't linear afterwards still do lining in the beginning to get experience with it and to build your brush control it's going to build your brush control for fine detail faster than any other technique on the planet because you have to be slow and methodical and precise yes i absolutely agree 100 percent shadow raven that was one of the selling points of this neighborhood there's no hoa because it is an old neighborhood A neighborhood from the 50s when there were no such things. We are very, uh, very happy with that. David doesn't know how happy he is because he hasn't ever experienced the opposite, but I did experience the HOAs when I was in Texas. And I won't share my word for them on stream because then Quindy would have to ban me and I'm kind of the host, so that would be bad. I don't see a Kariniko here. Is she out today? I can't remember if she was if she was out. I think she was. Uh, HOA Housing uh, Housing Something Organiza Association. So Kihasu essentially here in America, HOAs are popular because neighbors want to hold themselves accountable. They want to have some sort of recourse, legal recourse, if um, one of the neighbors likes leaves garbage over their front, you know, all over their front yard or does not mow their lawn and gets weeds everywhere. Essentially, anything done to the neighborhood that doesn't keep it property values good, um, the HOA is, uh, is interested in. Homeowners Association, thank you. Um, I couldn't remember because I blocked it. I blocked it out of my mind. Um, However, the other good thing that HOAs do is they do take in money to maintain community spaces. So if you have a park on in your community or you have a pool, like a swimming pool, um, the HOA uses funds to maintain those facilities for everybody to enjoy. So at my old community, we had a big pond and also a pool, a public swimming pool. And uh, the funds went to make sure the landscaping was kept up and that the pond was, you know, regularly taken care of and that the, um, the swimming pool was, you know, kept clean and orderly and stuff was fixed when it was broken. So that's the good side of HOAs. But the bad side is, it's just like, is, is like the people who run them are people who own houses in the neighborhood. 
And often the people who seek power in HOAs are not your best neighbors. <laughs> They're kind of the worst neighbors. Um, not always, but often. I don't know. Ours had kind of a mix. But there was just, like, all it takes is one bad apple just to bring the, um, bring the discussion back to fruit. All it takes is one person who's really, like, kind of loves to mess with everybody else's business. And then it becomes not fun in a hurry. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and there are those that, like Red Links brought up, is that there are often, these are organized, but then they just take money and they really don't do much. Yeah, there's always that one person. And they also have, like, the ability to level damages on you legally, so... That's not good. And they can make rules, like how many pets you can have, for example. Like rules that are just like, you're like, what? You know? Like you should be able, you own your house. You should be able to have three dogs if you want. But some HOAs will tell you, no, no, you can only have two. Things like that. So it's, it's like there's all sorts of arbitrary weirdness that goes on. And stuff that arguably impinges on your freedoms as a homeowner owner of property but if you sign up to do it because you you want a house in that neighborhood and that house they won't sell you the house unless you you are part of the hoa you've got no choice so yeah or how you can fence your yard or whether you can put a fountain in your yard or whether you can do anything like that right even if you can get a tool shed for your yard so yeah, so that's the problem. And I th the idea behind it is to keep people from putting big eyesores, big nasty, you know, who knows, like sandcastles in their backyard. Anything ugly and, and that's going to bring down everybody's, like, uh, the beauty of the neighborhood, right? But that beauty's in the eye of the holder, and it's arbitrary, and so that's where you run into problems. So in America, if you don't want that, you typically buy a house in an older neighborhood or in the country where there is no such thing. And we did the older neighborhood. We were looking at a house and actually did bid on a house with an HOA. Um, and we didn't get that one. We're kind of happy we didn't. But yeah, so that's what an HOA is. That's why most of us have uh, virulent uh, opinions against. So what I'm doing here, notice, I'm making a band of shadow on the inside of the leg and a band of shadow on the outside. You can do this either way. You could put the highlight in first and then put the shadow down. However, it makes it easier for you to envision it. Yes, there is also a monthly fee because of uh, public like areas being maintained, like playgrounds, parks, and pools or ponds. All the three Ps. We had playgrounds in our neighborhood as well in Texas, so that was also maintained. Now, to be fair, our, our HOA did actually maintain the areas pretty well. Like, the pool was always nice. The pond was always, like, the landscaping around the pond was was kept nice. They replaced plants that died, and, you know, they, they did their job. But it was still an HOA. And every time, because in Texas, grass is a weed, Every time, like, grass grew up through our shrubs in front, somebody was dinging us on it. Like, it's like, seriously, we cannot keep grass from growing up through the shrubs. Because the grass is out of control. Once it gets into the beds, it's evil. So, yeah, so we just got very, I got very frustrated with the HOA for dinging us on that. I did my best, man. But I didn't have a ton of time. There we go. So I'm essentially taking this very thin carbon gray and I'm bringing it in just like I did up here. And the thinking behind this is as you look at the model, you can see that the light is going to fall on the leg, right? You can see that this is a lighter gray and that's entirely because the light from the window and the ring light is falling on the front of this leg. So right away you can see that this is in the light, right? And this is in shadow down here. So on either side of the light on a cylinder is going to be a band of shadow with NMM. Um, Kihasu, it's weirder than that. 
Because, yeah, the company, so a housing company would buy the land. They would build the houses on it. They would sell them. But the homeowners association, they hand over their legal power to a homeowners association composed of the people who own houses in there. So the people who own houses, some of them will be interested in being on the homeowners board. And those people will run for an election and they will get elected. And then the neighborhood runs itself as its own legal entity. So the company that built the houses builds the houses and then says, okay, we're done. Because they don't want any part of it after that. So they hand it over to the HOA. So it's actually not the company. It's actually the homeowners, which is actually worse. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's all sorts of stories out there of people who, like, did crazy things because their homeowners association was being crazy. Yeah, because that's exactly the sort of thing that they'll do. It's like if, if, for example, you can't leave your trash containers out visible from the road, then they will absolutely follow through with, like, threatening you with fines if you don't fix it. Even if it's, like, only a tiny bit visible from one angle, someone will get their knickers in a twist about it. This is the problem with people. <laughs> So now I'm going to start blocking in some highlights. Now I do need to block in a shadow under here. So you can, as I was saying, you could do this either way. You could block in the highlight first and then put the shadows on either side. Or you could do start with the shadows. Once you have an, uh, an idea of how light falls, you can start with shadows. But if you're just beginning, you almost certainly want to start with blocking in the highlight first, and then figuring out the shadow. It's much easier. So right up here on the kitty's head, you can see how this, this part is lighter gray because it's getting the light. And then you can see right right here where it drops off, it's getting the shadow. So your dark shadow goes here. Then you can see another highlight right here where it hits this little rim on the helmet, right? So and you can see like highlights at the end where these little scales are sticking out onto the shoulder. Things like that. So use your brain with NMM, but then you have to do a couple of extra steps to make sure it looks shiny. Um, are you on my Patreon, Kodiak? If you are, look up layering. So on my Patreon, patreon.com slash painting big, if you go to the very front page, you'll be able to search by keyword. I thoroughly keyword every single post that I do. So you can search for a term like layering or blending, and you will essentially come up with all the posts that are in your level that address that. So if you want, and, and understand that you can do NMM, like you can practice NMM with just, with those lines in between the colors. Doesn't matter. You can still do it. Um, and then essentially to check it, what you do is you take it and you hold it away from you so you can see it and hold it at like half arm's length. Then the lines between the colors kind of go invisible because you're holding it way out here and you'll be able to see if it looks like it's shiny or not. So you can start with NMM without ha being a good blender. But if you're really going to be worried about blending, then you need to just work on blending. And you can see that on my Patreon. Absolutely. Yeah. Use that search function. If you guys, I know a lot of you are on my Patreon, use the search function on Patreon. I keyword everything. You can search for painting black. You can search for non-human skin tones. You can search for non-metallic metal. You can search for painting red. You can, you can search for all sorts of stuff. Um, and sometimes, like, the only inconsistency is sometimes, like, you might find something under skin tones or you might find it under painting skin tones. So you may want to, like, kind of play around with your keyword searches. Um, but I try to be consistent. I try to always reuse terms. So you shouldn't get too much of that. Yeah, usually you are looking for wet blending or layering to get those smooth transitions between blends. And that's one of the basic, like... Layering is one of the basic, um, I would say it's, it's the thing that separates a basic painter from an intermediate painter. When you start to do layering and you start to see some success with it, that's, that's where you're starting to transition into an intermediate level painter where you've mastered all your mechanical techniques. And then from there, I think that painters that have mastered like all the mechanical and all, all of the conceptual techniques then are advanced level, like, or who are at least solid on them. You're never going to be perfect. There's always improvement to be made. Good, good, good. Yeah, 
Yeah, the unfortunate part of HOAs is that in a community of 2,000 homes, you typically only find six-ish people who actually want to be on the HOA board, and everybody else just wants to complain. Yep, <laughs> that's the other problem. No, the sword is not going to be purple. I don't know what color it's going to be yet, but it's not going to be purple. Uh, that would look weird to me. It would look like a giant crayon sword. Yeah, exactly. And it has the same problems probably as a sports club. I knew I have a friend in Canada who who um has while her kids were still at home, she was like on the board for like I think they're volleyball or hockey team, I can't remember. But it was it was a lot like that. It's like very few people willing to do the work and you just hope those people are good people. But mostly people are just trying to vote people into power who they think they can influence or who have their own opinions, right? So yeah, so I'm going to lighten up the front of the leg here. Missed him. Thank you. 30 months. That's insane. That's really cool. Thank you so much for subbing to us for that many months. Much sub love. So yeah. So I would say if you're going to try NMM, like first of all, I think you do need to really get a good concept of highlighting and shading, regular highlighting and shading before you try special effects. I know nobody wants to hear that. I know that there are lots of people who have not mastered highlighting and shading who are like, I'm going to do NMM. But if you want to make it easier for yourself and everybody wants things to be easier, right? Right? If you want to make it easier for yourself, first work on overhead lighting or zenith lighting as it's called or zenithal lighting all those terms then once you really have an idea of okay i understand intuitively where highlights and shadows should follow my model and i am working on painting them better at that point then start even if your blending isn't great then start working on nmm because then you can the highlights are going to be the same with a small variation so you can, if you have a good solid like idea, just like I said on the hat, let's just do the hat. Let me, let me show you this. Yeah, black swords have been, um, I just think purple would be like atrocious. I don't know, purple, the idea of a purple sword, would it, would it fit with Kitty? Yes, but I would never do just like an all purple sword. I think it would be too garish. Just my art sense is offended, Pendrake. What I would consider doing though, Pendrake, on that note, is I would consider doing what I did. Um, do you remember what I did with the orcs uh, staff? where I would do most of the sword in the silver steel, but then toward the end, maybe I would do a fade of purple just toward the end to suggest that the sword is magical or has like, you know, properties. Like I would do that. So if I'm going to include purple, I would not go, I really feel like the whole sword, doing the whole sword purple would be rather garish, even though we are painting an orange tabby. And if any cat, if any tabaxi is going to have like garish art sense, it's probably an orange tabby. But anyway, so all right, look at the, look at the head in the light. Just by using a lamp over your painting area, you can do this. You can just hold up your model and you can right away see that we've got all this light area. And then we've got a shadow area, like every, all the vertical uh, parts, you can see they're in shadow. You can also see this little shadow here between the, like behind the ear. But mostly is the highlight goes to here and then it drops off as that helmet goes vertical instead of horizontal. So the light just kind of falls off the surface then, right? Because the light just isn't hitting the, the vertical surface. If you can understand that, then you're already getting close to where you need to be. Yeah, when you say purple sword, I imagine just like a purple crayon tacked onto the end of the hilt. <laughs> Putting some purple in the sword, though. That's doable. But uh, we'll see. Maybe not. I've got to see how everything else turns out. It won't be orange, I'll tell you that, because we have orange right next to the sword. So, But we're not talking about that right now anyway. We're talking about NMM. So I've got five colors, right? And uh, this, is, this is actually my base coat. Then we kind of have a mid-color, right? And then a highlight, and then a highlight. The highlight, the pure white highlight is only used in a couple of little spots. That's cool that you have the bunny boot, Joe Frick. So you can see that the light is all over the top of the head. So you would really paint this um, light blue pretty much on the top of the head. And... Kind of look at the angles, 
like the helmet does start to go horizontal here, but it doesn't go like straight down like it does on the sides. So since there's a little bit of this angle here, it's pretty safe to assume that this whole forehead area will also be light. So we're essentially base coating, base coating a highlight area right now. We're not dealing with the, with the metallic nature of it, but you can start your NMM just doing a regular old highlight. Yes, purple crayon sword. There are models that that would be brilliant on, but this is not one. So this little ridge of metal here as well. And I need to get the top of the ears. Because they're facing the light. Wherever there are creases in the armor, I'll leave that little shadow in there. And put a little drop of water in this. It's a little bit thick. Always thin your paint. If you're having trouble with transitions, thin your paint. Any amount of thinning will help you. If you're working with really thick paint, you're never going to get blending unless you're wet blending, which is a whole different topic on its own. And I wouldn't do it. Um, it's very hard to do on small areas. I won't say I wouldn't do it because I've regularly done it on NMM swords, but so we've got light all over the top. See how it's much lighter than the side right here. So that said, we know that the light is also hitting this little scalloped edge right here because you can see it, right? You can see that it's lighter. So go ahead and use your medium highlight. This is the highlight that's uh, not as bright as pure white. Now, these guys, these, these little uh, triangular plates, these are a little harder, but really we're gonna do the same kind of very simple pattern we did down here. So we're going to look especially at ones that are sticking out, like the ones that kind of curve out onto the shoulder. Like this one curves out a little bit. You can kind of see that the light hits these two a little bit more. You can also see that the light hits the, uh, the very corner of this one, right? Because whenever you've got these overlapping scales, the areas that are under the scales above them are going to be kind of recessed, but then the edges that are overlapping are going to be pushed out. And so it's okay to put a highlight on the points of those. And on this one, I would put most of it in highlight, except for the areas directly overlapping. So the ends of this would be the little edge of this. This one's really in the light. It's coming out onto his shoulder, so we can do almost the whole thing. Yeah, so mouse like having a crayon sword is uh, is totally doable. Yeah, because do you understand? Because the the parts that are that are being overlapped are going to be dark. They're going to be in shadow because the scales above them are overlapping. So to see that, we will line. That's what the lining is trying to tell you. It's trying to essentially create a framework where it's shading wherever a plate is coming out from underneath it. And it's also trying to bring out these details. So with the lining, you can kind of do a shadow at the top of each of these little scales. Quite a bit here on the helmet because uh, you can see this is, the helmet comes out quite a bit. See how much it projects? So you could go a little bit darker shadow right under that helmet to bring it a little bit, see it now the, only the tip is light and we've got a shadow there. So we're just, right now, we're just highlighting exactly as we would if this was not metal. And I'll show you where it changes. But on little areas like this where it's a little filigree, you just kind of generalize. You do the shadow, you do the highlight. So the lining is not as strong as it as it was over here because I thinned it a little bit more. And the scales that are sticking out more, like the end scales here that are coming out over the shoulder or the chest, will generally be lighter than the ones that are hanging straight down. That's what we've done here. So 
just bring in a little bit more shadow underneath areas where it makes sense. Also on little areas, you don't need perfect blending. You can't get it really. It's just a tiny little area. I need to get the very edge of this again. Cause I darkened it down there. So, all right, so we've got this kind of like, this is like if it was a cloth cap, this is how we would highlight it. Now, first shadows. We already know that the shadow is going to be in this vertical area, but not all of this shadow is going, this is where the metal gets weird, where this would be perfectly okay, but now we're going to make it shiny. So the way to make a thing shiny, there are two qualities for NMM. Let's start with that. Shiny and reflective. You are trying to suggest that the surface is shiny and you are trying to show that it is reflective. These are the two qualities of metal that we are trying to build an illusion around, right? That's why you keep a card, Joferk. Keep a card. That way you have your mixes. I even have a binder for mine now. So if you come up here, now if you were shading this normally, you might shade this whole area. But with metal, the darkest shadow is gonna be right under like your brightest highlight. And your brightest highlight is gonna be right where the light falls off the side of this helmet. So right between, right at the edge of light and dark is where your brightest highlight will be and right under that is where your shadow is. This is where it starts getting weird. This is why NMM is a conceptual technique and not a mechanical technique. You cannot simply learn to NMM without thinking about it. Blending you can learn to do and you don't have to really master any particular light sourcing or anything like that. Um, but NMM, you must, uh, you must actually be able to visualize this stuff and to understand how light acts. That's why I call it a conceptual technique. Mechanical techniques like blending will help your NMM look good. But so there's that bright highlight. There's a dark shadow starting up there. Notice I did not extend the shadow all the way down. There's a reason for that. Let me just hit this highlight. I'll explain in a second why that highlight is there. But so now we want a dark shadow underneath that bright highlight. It is the putting together of dark and light that creates the illusion of shiny, putting them together very close to each other. So I'm going to pop the shadow even darker up near the top. I use little artist trading cards. Joe Ferg. That way I can just buy binder sheets and just put them into card binders, just like magic cards. Because these are about the same size, I think, as standard cards. <clears throat> I'll just scribble what model it was, it was on them, and then I can put them in a binder. And it's really, the artist trading cards, like you can get Bristol, like ones that are Bristol, which are a light card stock, or you can get, these are watercolor. But I have both. I have Bristol and watercolor. They both work equal, equally well with the small amounts of paint we use. I highly recommend doing this just to uh, keep yourself organized. If you tend to use a lot of mixes and you might want to go back and touch something up at some point. And if you're not like me, you don't have the superpower of mixing. Like I can pretty much match anything at this point, but I still like to have my mixes if I'm working on a model. So, all right, so now I'm going to bring in another weird thing. So dark next to light gives you shiny, but what gives you reflective? Well, it's looking at where your highlight is and thinking about where light might be bouncing. So if the light is catching this little edge here, this little edge is going to have a strong white highlight toward the middle. So that's going to be bringing that up much brighter. But that light is going to go somewhere. It's not just going to sit there. It's actually going to reflect up at this metal right next to it. But it's not going to be as strong as the light itself. So a reflection is never as bright. It's never up to pure white. But that means we can bring in a bit of highlight here. And we can almost go up to pure white because this is such a light-colored armor. So I'm going to make kind of a little spot blend on my brush. 
Also, obviously in 28 millimeter, you wanna use a brush with a really fine tip so that you can do really controlled stuff. Because some of these highlights, you're gonna to need to get them really, really um, like fine detail. I want this to blend a little bit more, so I'm gonna bring my shadow down a bit because a lot of this will be kind of shaded. So now we've got that coming down, we've got a highlight, we've got that. All right, so if I was doing this, or since I am doing this in MM, that's how I would do it. Highest highlight, darkest shadow, blend back up. There's another little, This I would count this little surface as a separate surface. And I think I am gonna put a tiny dark line there between them. Because again, contrast. If you don't have contrast, then it's not gonna look shiny. So I'm gonna darken down that line there a bit. Maybe even put some shadows on either end of this little um, fringe. And sometimes I even I have to go back and forth and go, okay, like, did I get too dark? Did I get light? Did I, you know, where's my highlight going? Did I do it right? Because you have to stop and think about it. Every time you do an MM, you're stopping and thinking about the surface and you're tailoring it. You're tailoring your uh, painting to that particular surface. And this is an unusual surface. It's not on every model. So it's a little harder. Why do I put this highlight at the top? So NMM metal is essentially like a kind of a mirrored surface. Think about a mirror with lots of facets like a disco ball. The one that is like looking the brightest to you is the one that's actually reflecting the light right at your eyes. So if this, somewhere in this, somewhere in this mirror between where it's angled upward, now it's angled more out, more out, more out, more out, now it's like perpendicular. Somewhere in here is where the light is falling down and bouncing right out at your eyes where you're looking at it. And that is where the bright highlight, the brightest highlight goes is where the light is falling down. And as this curves around the angle, somewhere on this curve, it's gonna be flashing toward your eyes. And that's why that highlight goes there. And it doesn't matter if you're super precise because this model is so small, you just have to get really close. Yeah, it's easy to control in 2D because you are controlling the precise viewing angle. Now it also changes depending on the shape of the surface, like these cylinders here, as you can see. But generally, brightest highlight is where the light is gonna be directly reflecting at your eyes, the eyes of the viewer. And the question of where you are is solved by the viewing angle. So if you're looking at him right here, tackle it just from this angle. If there's also a, a, si a side that's an interesting side, that's probably also a viewing angle. This is a viewing angle. This is definitely a viewing angle because the shield makes it more interesting. So I would say this guy actually, flat as he is, this guy actually does have four viewing angles because you're not only just gonna be looking at him face on, you're gonna be looking at him from this side. Probably because the, um, the reason is the metal armor is very interesting, the shapes of it. But yeah, the basics of NMM, and this is what I taught in the ancient, ancient NMM handout that used to be in the old Learn to Paint Kit too when I wrote those instead of Rhonda, or sorry, Learn to Paint Kit 3. Highest highlight, darkest shadow right under it, away from the light source, highlight back up to an under reflection. Because there'll be a light that's reflecting up on the, toward the underside of the model. Breastplate, highest highlight, where the light is hitting. In this case, it's a burnished breastplate, so it doesn't have a super spot highlight, it just has a broad highlight. Underneath that, dark shadow, down here, we got to highlight up to an under reflection. So we got to bring this color up. Not as bright as your top highlight, a step down from that. Usually it involves mixing pure white with, um, or whatever your top light is with your uh, next highest highlight.
If you have, still have your copies of those directions, you have absolutely no excuse. No matter <laughs> you must, uh, you you know these rules already. You must know these rules. So there, here, probably here. When you've got numerous, like you've got a cylinder that's wrapping around the model, you're going to start tackling this from various directions. I'm not even going to get into it really because that's probably a little beyond some people who are just learning. But notice how the rule stays the same: is highlight, shadow, under reflection. Highlight, shadow, under reflection. Highlight, shadow, under reflection. Like simple, simple. 28 millimeter NMM, super easy. When you get bigger, then you're getting into the crazy. But even then, even then these rules still hold. It's just you can then wiggle with them in various ways. They wiggle in various directions. Thalocyanine. But yeah, so you're always going to see it. The only time you're going to see it weird now is on vertical surfaces that are rounded. Um, then again, you're going to see it a little bit weirder, right? Because now it's an up and down cylindrical surface like our, like what, our brush ferrule? Why, yes. Yes, indeed, it is like our brush ferrule. And what do we see here? Always look at things around you in the environment, for examples, by the way. So what we see on our brush ferrule, if I get my thumb out of the way, is we see a bright highlight, we see a dark shadow on one side of it, we see another dark shadow on the other side of it. Now here, we're seeing a really dark shadow here, but that's because I'm wearing a black shirt and that is actually the reflection of my black shirt on the ferrule. So if I put my hand here, that disappears. So the reason we're seeing all these little bands of light toward me, where that dark, dark shadow now just popped up again, the reason we're seeing that is that this is chrome. This is essentially a very, very shiny metal. So, so that's why it's an exception. However, if you look at it, you can still see the rules in place. You can still see, especially on the outer side, you can see the brightest highlight coming toward your eyes, right? Your eyes are the camera in this case. A little shadow right next to it. And then on the outer edge here, you can see it coming up to an outside highlight that's a lighter gray than your main highlight. See it? So when you start going, when you start learning NMM, look at all the stuff out in the environment. Don't look at chrome if you can. Chrome is gonna just confuse you because there's gonna to be too many reflections. It'll still like hold kind of true, but you may get confused just because there's like with the ferrule, it's just so many color reflections. Like there we go. Because then it's gonna start reflecting like this. Though you still can kind of see it. But use something like, um, you know, then you can get crazy and you can see like all the reflections of little lights here. Let's see if we can get this to work. Boom. There you go. So what you can see is that I'm exaggerating the darkest shadow, right? So if you look up, you've got that, that uh, slanted surface that's reflecting the light directly toward our eyes. You can see that there is, I'll even force it here. See, there's still that line dark shadow right under there. Even as my skin tone gets more and more to take up the knife, you can still see that dark shadow right at that under that highlight, right? Even when I start tilting and tilting it, that dark shadow still holds. Still holds, still holding. Now I'm starting to turn away from the light. Now my highlights are shifting. Weird, right? Now look at where that darkest shadow is. It's actually on that flat area that had the brightest highlight. And we are still seeing an under reflection on the other flat surface. There you go. Brightest highlight, darkest shadow, under reflection, metal. Got it? Demonstrated with a real world object. And real world objects will demonstrate for you all the time if you let them. But you have to actually get your butt out of like staring at your phone and look around you. I have to do this with myself regularly on walks. Stop living in my head and start looking at the crap around me. It's kind of my time to do that. So on a cylindrical surface, it really depends. Like the front of the lake here is kind of flat. So I could paint it as a, a bulk object or I could try to put 
more of a white highlight down the middle. Or if there are two edges like there are here as it gets over his knee, I could kind of do a white highlight on either side. Well, then you're not going to learn NMM. <laughs> or if you are staring at your phone, you better be staring at pictures of metal objects. But it is better to do it in real life. Uh, jokes aside, it is better to actually do it in real life because, uh, I mean, sometimes photographs can be useful because it's staged. But sometimes you can't really tell where the light is coming from. It's, it's like trying to find good gemstone pictures to paint from. You sometimes can't tell where the light is coming from, and so you don't know if it's really correct for what you're painting. And when you're working with conceptual techniques, it's really useful to have a concept as far as if what you're painting is correct and has the correct light sourcing. Otherwise, you can get in trouble. So if I paint pure white over this, and then I paint some of my previous light across that pure white, it'll attempt to blend it in a little. Yeah, or they've been manipulated or they've been photoshopped, right? Um, I go to the Renaissance Fair because I'm here in America where we have those things. But museums are also great if you don't have a Renaissance Fair near you. Ren fairs are great because people will be actually out wearing the armor in, in sunlight. And that's, or it'll be on a shelf, you know, it'll be out on a display in sunlight with trees around. Like much more of a setting where you might run into a, in a fantasy world. So, whereas a museum is going to have, we're going to have indoor lighting, which you're usually, that's usually not what you're painting. So, that's why uh, I think, like, reenactments, renaissance fairs, or um, just metalworking, like, crafting festivals that would have metalworking in attendance, all of those things are good references. Yes, and turkey legs. And giant garlic pickle garlicky pickles. I really like those. Most Renaissance my old Renaissance fair had giant garlicky pickles. They were one of my favorite things. So bringing up that highlight there. And a mem reference, Shadow Raven. And mead. This is true. I used to drink a lot of mead. Now I cannot drink it anymore, but that's okay. Yeah, using real world, world references is what's all about. So here, because we're in a cylindrical, vertical setting, we've got kind of another weird thing. And this is why when you're doing um, NMM, it helps to know where your light is coming from. And usually what you'll find is people will paint with the light coming from slightly ahead, slightly in front, and above. Like kind of at this angle. Which makes it much easier when you go to paint cylinders because then you know your highlight's going to be on the front. Because you've got that light coming at that angle. The other way that people paint typically is with a diffused light coming from everywhere, which has the same effect because that diffuse light will still be running at a slight angle down the front of the light. Oh my gosh, those pickles are awesome though, Gary Michael Cosby, aren't they? Like super fresh and crunchy and garlicky. I love them and giant. I adore those things. Like I wish I could just buy those things, but of course they're too big for most pickle jars. Maybe I should just learn to make my own in a giant pickle barrel. It's essentially you're eating a cucumber. An entire cucumber. So we still have our reflection though, right? So we've got, now we're thinking more from the frontal because we've got a slight angle. So we've got our front and then our shadow and then our reflection. But we're also gonna have, you can see, I didn't carry the shadow all the way down the leg because you're also gonna have this rim. Yeah, I agree, Lady Katara. They're very good. They are very refreshing. Well, with all that fattening food and alcohol, having something acidic can be a nice compliment. So I'm going to get the bottom of each of these plates, just like I got the bottom of each of these little scales. So already, right away, this is starting to look more metal.
And if I darken this shadow, and this is why I thinned down my uh, carbon gray a lot, is because I knew I was going to want to kind of build up shadows. And I didn't want the brush strokes. So the answer to blending is thinned paint. So now I've darkened that shadow significantly, so it will start to look more shiny, more like armor. NMM is just one of those um, one of those things that you shouldn't start a full model like this. Um, what you should probably start with is just a very simple model. Actually, I have a great model for it. Hold on, I'll show you the model I used for my class, guys. One second. Let me, uh, oh, he might be behind me. Yeah, he is. Good. Good for me. Here. Now, we did the whole wavy colors inside and out thing, so don't worry about that. But this orc guy, the Orc Marauder from Bones USA, he's a great model to practice NMM on. The only downside to him is these darn spikes, but if you just paint the surface and you kind of ignore the spikes at first, then you can use him as a real good model. But the thing you should start learning NMM on is like a sword. Ideally, like a sword held out like kitties or held up and out. But you don't want to necessarily be painting a sword that's held straight up and down. It's more hard. If you have one that's more this way, it'll be better. Because then you'll know that your top surface is going to be lighter. Just like on my knife, right? Like Just like the knife handle. See it? The top surface will be lighter, then you'll have a shine, then you'll have a shadow, then you'll have an under reflection. And that you can even see that the far edge of the knife is a little lighter. Like it's a it's a little bit, it's almost chromey, but there's it's slightly lighter on this far edge. And that's exactly what you're doing with a sword. You're doing the upper surface lighter, you're doing a shadow. And you're keeping your, your shadow pretty small. I didn't actually finish this in class because there was lots of questions and people distracting me. So you can start with just doing a thin line. And right away, that gives you a little bit more. Just adding some water to my paint so I can blend that in. So you can keep your shadow really narrow, and you should probably. And then you can essentially blend it in by bringing it up a little darker, a little lighter. I use different colors for this, but. Don't want to lose it all though. I lost most of it there. There. Better. So you do want that shadow to be there. You don't want it to be just a thin line. You do want a little bit of a blend. But it's where that note that it's where the darker colors are on this, where it looks shiny. When you are lacking that dark, it doesn't look shiny anymore. So that's the key here. That's the biggest mistake that people make with NMM constantly is they don't do their shadows or they don't do them dark enough. Because it's very difficult. They don't. They usually don't because it's very difficult to do it, right? You're blending from almost black to pure white. That's the hardest blend out there. That's why NMM steel can be so hard for people who are just starting out. I am not teaching any moonlight. Um, the reason is that we might have a tiny puppy at that point. So I'm going to try to come to the con, but no guarantees. Because this may be the only Reaper con I miss. Because the puppy will be too young to be kenneled or puppy sat. Like, just, it's 10 weeks old at that point. So my only option is to actually drive with the puppy to Texas for Reaper con in order to make Reaper con. And that's going to be kind of brutal. So, and it also might be hard on the puppy. So I have not yet decided what's going on. I already shot Ron an email that, a warning of sorts, that I might not make it. Um, so we'll see. It really depends on the puppy. If the puppy is like really outgoing and really like, you know, like a puppy where, where she's like super happy and loves people, then maybe we come to ReaperCon. 
But if it's a puppy who is a little bit more reserved, maybe a little bit shyer, that's going to be overwhelming. So I'm going to kind of play it by ear. We have a room already booked and David is definitely going. Um, but he may just go without me. I already talked to him about it. It's just the way it may go. I was kind of hoping that the puppy would be ready to go home like right after ReaperCon, but that is uh, not what's happening. So, Also, uh, in three weeks, we should find out uh, how many puppies there are for sure. That's when the x-ray is. So yeah, I have taught at every ReaperCon. I have attended every ReaperCon from the very first ReaperCon. I even have a t-shirt from the very first ReaperCon, one of the few in existence. Me and Bobby Jackson still rock those. Um, but uh, this year may be the year I miss. I'm going to fill in around these rivets. Whenever you've got like rivets or spikes, you should fill in around them dark. Then you can just pop a white highlight onto them. You don't have to like do anything complicated with rivets on NMM. Yeah, especially on 28 millimeter, you just simplify it. But yeah, so this may be the one endless ReaperCon. We'll see. It also depends. I'll be driving the puppy home with me from North Dakota. And uh, if, if she's a really good road puppy, that'll also influence the decision. Whereas if she's car sick a lot, that'll definitely influence the decision in the other manner, other way. So yeah, totally all about the pupper this year. Next year, she'll be old enough. Like once the puppy is over, you know, a year old, then she's no longer. Then she's she's a dog and she can be, I can get a dog sitter for her. But yeah. Yeah, it'll have to be Ron. And that means it's going to take forever. <laughs> He's going to have to practice his speed reading. Ron will be your replacement Anne, most likely. He'd love that, not. <laughs> I'm sure he's kind of crossing his fingers that I make it after all. But we'll see. We'll see. It is ReaperCon. It is. It's ReaperCon. Like. So yeah, I will be making my decision based on the puppy and how I feel. If the, and if, you know, if the puppy, uh, you know, were even a little older at that time, then maybe, but it's like going to be such a baby puppy. It's going to be a baby puppy and like a week and a half before ReaperCon, I'll have driven from North Dakota to California. And then I got to like turn around and drive from California to Texas. It's kind of insane. Yeah, Ron is probably like sweating right now. Like when he thinks about that award ceremony, sweat is rolling down his face, like hoping to God that I make the, uh, I make the con. Ah, blorf. So I got a little bit out of control there. I'm going to take some water and just scrub it off. Whenever you do a blorf, don't stop. Don't hesitate. Just grab some water, scrub off your blorf. But yeah, we'll see. We will see. I am just excited. Because puppy, guys. Puppy. I haven't started buying stuff yet. Except for the book. The training book. I did dig out all my dog tricks books, though. Because I am going to do trick training with the puppy. Though first we have to work on the basics. But we're going to learn tricks. So the legs starting to look better. Let's do these little, I showed you, I talked about doing these little plates. Here, here though, this hip plate, it's just not looking right at all. And that's because it doesn't have a dark shadow. So we're gonna do a little bit of a dark shadow here. 
When a plate of metal curves like over a hip, whenever it's curving, shoulders or hips, those are essentially, you treat it like a cylinder because it's curving. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I dug out my um, my Monks of New Skeet puppy guide, although that's kind of out of date for what I'm doing at this point, but still good general advice. And uh, I dug out my trick training books. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what I can do with with ye, ye puppy. I saw some people playing frisbee in the park yesterday when I walked by, and I'm like, oh no, it's because. If, if my old dog, if Blazy were here, like, she would have been after those frisbees. <laughs> I'll have to teach the puppy that some frisbees are hers and some frisbees are not hers. But who knows? She might not be a frisbee dog. Kiri never was. Kiri was just like, eh, I don't see the point of this. And Leo would chase it, but then sometimes he just wouldn't bring it back. But Blazy, Kiri's daughter... She was a frisbee fiend. I don't know if it's because I raised her to like to like the frisbee or what, but she like she would do those incredible leaps, like you see greyhounds or whippets doing into the air to catch frisbees, and she had these long legs, and it would just be insane. The air that dog would get. We don't really have a big enough space in our yard for doing frisbee, so we might have to go to a park for that if this puppy likes frisbee. Because really it just matters what the puppy likes on that point. Dogs are like people, and sometimes they just don't like the same things we like. So you should try to find something your dog likes to do. All right, so now we made kind of the stripey pattern there, and now it's looking a little bit better. But yeah, excited for the puppy, excited. Have a puppy journal already set up so I can keep track of things. Like how much the puppy weighs. We'll weigh her once a week until she's too big to get held. There we go. So let's go in and shade some of these little squares or little triangles or diamonds or whatever the heck they are. I don't know. It's Friday. It's Friday and my brain would like to go on vacation now, please. But we'll start shading at the top of those little um, diamonds on the hip. So we've made some progress today. But yeah, puppy, puppy, puppy. Soon enough, it will be all about the puppy. So putting a shadow at the top of each of these diamonds, you can see that. And I'm gonna put a bit more of a shadow toward the back here. I'm gonna actually directly shade a lot of these so they won't stay as high. Cause the same thing, um, Remember that even though these is, each of these is a separate plate, it's also a mass of texture. Like it's a woven piece of metal. And so although you can highlight it and on smaller pieces, like just with just a few scales, it makes sense to highlight them individually. When you get a big sheet of this sort of stuff, then you almost have to start highlighting it as a sheet. Like it's like one piece and then start breaking it up. So that's the other way I could have done this, is I could have highlighted all these sheet, all of these um, pieces really high in keeping with the highlights I've done down here in the shadows. And we can still probably do that.
I could essentially minimize the shadows I put in on the areas that are in line with this front broad highlight, like I did right here. And then I could bring more shadows in on this area so that it will be in line with the shadow that you see on the leg right here. So that we have a dark area going up into that. See how that is more like this is just all one area. This is just all one area. See that? But now we got to bring up more highlights back here because then we've got highlights coming up this area. So I'm going to use kind of my middle color here to start bringing this up. I don't want it super light. I just want to kind of check the positioning. That's a little better. And at every stage of this, I'm asking myself, after I execute a highlight shadow a high, uh, reflection, I'm asking myself, does this look convincingly metal? And I'm looking at it, do, is it starting to read as shiny and reflective? And if, I, if the answer is not quite, then I have to ask myself, why not? But this is looking pretty good. Pretty killer up here, actually. I do need more shadow back here. And I probably need to minimize this highlight here. So again, just asking myself, does it look great? If it doesn't look great, why not? Kind of it's evaluate my dark, light, dark, or, or light, dark, light rule and ask myself, am I following it? If I'm not following it, where am I not following it? And is that what is impacting the lack of shininess? Yeah, it's a little better. I think I need a little bit more highlight right on that plate to bring it all in. So because my highlight was pushed too far back and I needed everything to be in line here, That's better. So now that leg is reading really well. Lion Joker, it is all hard work. Talent is, uh, uh, talent is overrated. <laughs> Busting your butt and trying to analyze what you do is, is the only way to get good. Nobody comes to this stuff intuitively. We all have to work. It took me, it's taken me, let's see. It's taken me about 20 years. 20 years ago, I sucked at NMM. I didn't understand it at all. And then as I applied myself, I slowly got better and better. It probably took me about, I mean, it took me about 10 years from that. I guess like I started to understand NMM. 
I was sucking at it. I was sucking at it. And then when I started working for Reaper, writing that first Learn to Paint Kit 3 made me sit down and analyze these rules. And ever since then, it's been a battle of learning how to interpret the rules that I set up depending on the position of the piece of metal and the shape of the piece of metal. Yeah, but I mean, anybody can, there's, there's many schools of thought in the world about this, but the one that I believe in, because it is the one I have experienced is we are all noobs when we start and the amount of work and love you put into something, the amount of time, work and love is going to determine where you end up that and your actual goal. Like some people like go into a hobby with the goal of, I just want to do okay. I want a model that I can be, you know, like that I'm happy with that I can put on my gaming table. That's better than most of the people I know can paint. And that is absolutely a okay. Cool. And that is like super attainable. But if you decided at some point that your goal changed and you get interested in doing competitions or you get interested in maybe not even competing, but just learning to how to be your best painter, like, like finding out, just seeing how far you can go. Like even that, then it's just work and work and time and, and love. Like it's just that. And, and so you could do, you can become this, you can do this, it, but you've got to care about it and you got to put in the work and time. Yeah. Like some people do seem to come out of childhood with a more intuitive grasp of art, maybe because their parents encouraged it or, or maybe they have just, maybe genetically they have good hand-eye coordination, right? That's, that's definitely like maybe like something that would give you a leg up, a talent that kind of thing gives you a leg up. It doesn't make you this, like only a lot of work and, and work on understanding and the, the drive to get there. Like, and you don't have to work super hard at it. Like you can work a little bit every day or a little bit every week and you'll get there eventually. But yeah, I don't like the talent myth because it excludes people. Like somebody might not try mini painting because they don't think they're artistic at all. And they assume that you have to have an art talent to learn to mini paint. And you don't. Not at all. And the person who is really bad at this when they start. Say there are two people. Say one of them is like naturally, like some people would say artistically gifted. And then you've got your person who isn't artistic at all. If that artistically gifted person like sits on their butt and hardly works at the hobby and that not good at it at all person puts in the time, they will end up better than the artistically gifted person. Like absolutely will. Numerous disciplines have proven this. Whether it's writing or painting or, or sports Anything like that. Like now there are some sports where genetics do matter, right? Like swimming where the long torso like thing is, is, and the upper body mass is definitely a thing. So, so there is a bit there, like you could get to a certain point, but you're not going to get to Olympic level if you don't have the right, like body composition, right? So some things do require a certain physical set, but it's rare that you run into that. And in any creative hobby, that's not a thing as far as I've been able to tell. So never like think that just because you don't have a background in art or you've never been artistically talented or creative, never think you can't excel at this hobby because you absolutely can. A lot of people are like that dog father. They get into the hobby because it's cool looking or they're gamers or, you know, they just see the miniatures and kind of like it lights them up and they really think it looks fun. Like a great many of us are not like art people when we get into this hobby. And even me who was had a very long road to get good at it. Like, so yeah, never, never let it bar you just because you feel like you're not a natural at it. Like I, that's something that we've talked about before that society tends to tends to want to tell us that if, we, if, you're, if you try it and you're not good at it, you should just give up and try some, look for something else that you're better at. I don't agree with that at all. You should follow your heart and do what you love and 
if you run into barriers, you should think about how to get past them. So inevitably, you will run into barriers. Whether, whether your own mental barriers or those set by others. Trying to do a bit of wet blending here. Tiny wet blending is best accomplished with a tiny tip brush. But yeah. So bringing in the shadow there on the side of the leg because this plate is uh, curves out a bit and has a, a nick in it there. Yeah, absolutely, Abtaria. I believe I agree a hundred percent. You get out what you put in. If I started a new hobby, like okay, so I just picked up some knitting books. And if I started, if I, if I, they were for somebody else, but if I, if I decided to get into knitting, cause I'm looking at it and it's kind of looks kind of fun and cool, but I would be a hundred percent noob. And I know going in that I'm going to have my stuff suck for a long time, that I'm going to get out of it exactly as much effort as I put into it. And if I run into snags, literally, <laughs> I'm going to have to just figure out, you know, what, how to fix that. Right. Like, and that's the same as if I started a new painting hobby, like oil painting, which I, you know, I started working with miniatures and oils recently. It's a total alien beast, except, except I used to use oils on canvas, but I haven't touched them for like, gosh, a lot of years, almost 30 years. So it's always like, oh, okay. Learning paint sets. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Um. Lion Joker. Reaper has a learn to paint kit one and two. Learn to paint kit one is going to teach you like really basic techniques, like getting um, like base coating and shade, basic shading with washes and basic highlighting. Um, and then the next one is called layer up and it's going to teach you layering, which is what I've been doing here is putting thin paints and building them up to get smooth blends. Yeah. Core skills and layer up. So two kits. And the nice thing about those kits is that they come with like 10 or 11 paints in them and brush and minis uh, and then a great booklet, a really good instruction booklet because Rhonda's really good at writing instructions. Um, and so it's actually kind of a bargain. You actually get the paints at a significant discount because you're buying the whole kit. So it is a good way to build out your paint collection. And the two, two kits do not overlap with colors. So if you pick up both kits, you get totally different selection of colors. So yeah, I would, I heartily recommend Reaper's Learn to Paint Kit. There are other companies that put out kind of like getting started kits, but I really feel like the directions on ours are superior and also that you get quite a deal with it. With some, some sets, I feel like these days you don't get really a deal at all. But Reaper is always like, like wanted to help people get into the hobby, wants to enable folks to get into the hobby. And so... Their learn to paint kits are still pretty much like at a sale price. Like you get a lot more than you pay for with those kits. It's a good, good buy. But yeah, a lot of other companies have gone in and kind of made like starting uh, stuff. So now you can see the light falling here. You can see that we've got some shadow here. I need to work with this area a little bit for the under reflection. And I need to bring up really high highlights on the foot. So we're already at almost quarter after. So I'm going to actually just add like a really bright highlight down here on the foot to show you guys, and then we'll call it. So there, just with that, that additional bright highlight, it's like looking better. I don't have the dark shadows in yet though, so I'm not getting the drama. But now if we look at this whole side of the model, we're, we're really starting to see the light and the shine is really coming out. So that's, that's cool because that's, that's kind of what I wanted Kitty to look like. Like, I feel like Kitty is definitely looking very shiny, very paladin. And that's what I had hoped to achieve. 
Oh, and there's an expansion color set for each of the Learn to Paint kits now? Yeah, cool. Thanks, Clavicus. I wasn't sure. I thought I remembered that, but I am i haven't, like, looked for those products, so. Yep, I'm about to log off, too. You have a good, uh, good rest of your day, dog father. Okay. So what we did, we did a lot of NMM talk today. Also, we talked a lot about food. <laughs> Baked goods. And fruit! Yay, fruit! I need to go and get some more fruit, actually, for uh, lunch today. So yeah, I hope you all have a great weekend. I will be on, I believe. I should be on for um, tomorrow for my stream on twitch.tv slash paintingbig. Uh, we're going to continue. This should be the last week of green work on my giant wolfen model um, to get him ready for priming. So that's exciting. We just need to do some uh, adjustments on top of the head with green stuff, um, some elbow sculpting, and uh, there's just like... There's just like little bits, like just corrections. Oh, I need to fix the top of the muzzle and one of the eyes. So, so yes. So twitch.tv slash painting big. I also did just put two of my new YouTube videos live. Um, I've been doing a, if you're not a patron, then you can see my stuff on YouTube, like pretty much around the first or the second of every month. I put at least one new video up. Uh, so we did one on palettes and then I did also my, uh, my, or my origin story. Um, so those are up now on my YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, David wants me to start her, Grey Wolf, and they're sitting right over there. I see them. They're, they're still in my mind. I have not put them away in their box, okay? That's a good sign. But that is a big project, and there are actually a couple of projects that I'm more excited about right now. So don't worry. She'll get started with the Giant Wolfie, but not quite yet. Not quite yet. I've got a bust I really want to do. And I've got that wolfen. So now that I've got all this sculpting almost done, I need to need to paint that. It's like, I'm psyched. I'm psyched. I need to do it. So yeah. All right. Yes. And come back at 3 p.m. Central for Reaperland. And hopefully I'll see some of you on my stream tomorrow. All right. Have a great one, everybody. Bye-bye.